I'm Mary Grothy, CEO of Sales BQ. Welcome to this episode of the Quota Crusher podcast. Today, we have two guests on at the same time. Oh my gosh, I've never done this before. So I hope that I totally don't screw it up. But here we go. We have two guests. I met these gentlemen last year. And they invited me to be a guest contributor to this amazing new community of resources that they created. It's called SD Revolution. This is a community for SDRs full of content, access to professionals. And there's so much about the word community that's brought forth for SDRs. And I'm excited to welcome AJ and Grayson to the show. Welcome. How are you doing? Great to have you uh, be on here. Thanks for having us, Mary. Yeah. They just they just fought over who got to talk first. So that <laughs> yeah, was really funny. <laughs> oh, that was so great. As a reminder, with the Quota Crusher podcast, you can watch the video playback at any time. Just follow us on our YouTube channel, or you can stick with your uh, favorite podcast audio stream. So that's fine too. But AJ, I would love to hear a little bit about your background and really what brought you to this idea and co-creating SD Revolution. What did that look like for you? And then when you're done, I'm going to have Grayson answer the same question. Yeah, of course. Um, so it's actually a f- sort of funny, serendipitous kind of story. Grayson and I um, connected a while back because he was promoting a different video series at the time that he had recorded um, through his, his organization. And as he was prospecting me, he kind of slipped it in as sort of a secondary call to action. Very good SDR work on your behalf, Grayson, by the way. Um, but it was sort of like, hey, you know, maybe this isn't of interest, but we have this video series coming out. Maybe you want to take a look. We'll, you know, see what happens. And at the time, um, I had made it a commitment to sort of get more into video and really use that channel to help drive leads and and sort of build the the brand of Demand Drive, the company that I work with. Um, And so I took a shot in the dark and I was like, hey, Grayson, not only do I want to see this video series, but I would love to help create some videos. And from that moment on, the rest is kind of history. We we jumped headfirst into the creation of SD Revolution from there. And uh, it was a bit of a whirlwind for a while, I will not lie. Uh, I think we both kind of realized that we were in a bit over our heads, but after couple of months of working together, it, it flowed together pretty quickly. And uh, I think the final result kind of speaks for itself. It's pretty solid content, but don't say so myself. <laughs> awesome. Cool. So um, on my end, you know, I come from a, a startup and entrepreneur background. And so uh, selling is a, is a primary part of my job. And I got into video series because I really identified that creating content is a one of the best reasons to reach out to somebody, you know, if you have something valuable and relevant to share, you know, share it. Uh, And then it's also really great for staying in touch with people. I think, Mm -hmm. you know, our our conversation, AJ and I's conversation really kind of speaks to to why we created the series. You know, our entire opportunity in SD Revolution came because of the fact that I was sharing content with him and wanted to see what he was about and see what was he was interested in. And it kind of fell out from there. And so once we realized that content is really where we need to focus and sales development is where we kind of uh, met in terms of mutual interests, we said, let's go for it. Uh, we got our initial interviews and that started nine months ago and finally got the chance to launch in uh, February of this year. And that was a really exciting launch. I've seen it all over LinkedIn. I'm surprised at how quickly it caught so much attention. I think that you've done a phenomenal job with what you've created, but then also with getting it out to our community. I think it's really important. And so this is the plug portion of this. I'm going to do it early so that people can hear it now, and then we'll recap at the end. But talk about where people can get engaged. If there's a website, LinkedIn, where they're following, and then we'll go through the rest of our interview. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you can find us at sdrevolution.com. There you'll have uh, free access to a seven episode course on sales development and management. Uh, Mary is is one of of our guests. Uh, From there, if you would like to subscribe to our newsletter, we have a page for that. And we also have a page because we're looking for contributors. Um, Our goal here is two-sided. We want to find the leaders and the people who have influential things to, to say and put the spotlight on them while also looking at reps and people who are wanting to build that personal brand, you know, get the shoe in, gain exposure, and really create a platform so that the sales development community as a whole can grow. 
Um, and then other than that, if you're not a website browser, uh, we are on LinkedIn, <laughs> it's uh, SD Revolution. Okay, exceptional. And then tell me, yes, I was part of the first part of the launch, uh, one of the interviews that happened over the last nine months. And name a couple other names that you have in this initial lineup, because there's some pretty powerful voices that you that you snagged. Yeah, we were able to speak with uh, not just you, Mary, but um, a couple of sort of key names in there. Morgan J. Ingram uh, contributed a piece specifically on sort of uh, the new wave of sales development and how he's expecting reps to sort of behave in this modern environment. Um, we have an episode with Dana Lindahl, who's like a social selling savant. The guy is everywhere on LinkedIn. And obviously that's the topic of his episode as he speaks towards uh, how managers can better prepare their teams to, to use LinkedIn for, for sales development. Um, we got Tom Jenkins from CloudTask. He did a great episode on uh, using web chat and sort of the rise of that channel in sales development today. So a whole lot of different topics that we covered, uh, a lot of different uh, great guests, Grayson. I don't know if you wanted to highlight anyone else in, in particular, but um, I mean, people can go watch themselves if they want. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look, I love the lineup. I think this is something huge that you've done for the community. I am part of my episode with you all and then just thoughts that I generally have about SDRs is the community that seems to be underdeveloped. It seems to be a placeholder role. It's a feeder. It's quickly get them into the organization, put them through rigorous training, move them up through the ranks if they survive. And it's very interesting to see how cutthroat it is in some organizations and then how completely unstructured and, well, I don't know, make some calls. Isn't that what an SDR does in other organizations? So it's interesting to see that you have the full spectrum when people are bringing on SDRs. In our episode, we talked about the importance of infrastructure, building infrastructure before hiring. And if you bring on an SDR team, if it's a newer team, a younger team, those that are coming through college or coming out of maybe just their first job, but still very young in their careers, some of the challenges that I've seen with these folks is they don't have the professional maturity and that's not their fault because they haven't been in an environment to accumulate those years. And I think back to my first professional job, I didn't, well, this is back when people had to fax things, but I was a receptionist and there was very little culture training, like how to act as a professional work human being and just basic around the office tasks. And it was just a very different environment for me to go from the lifestyle and part-time jobs and bartending and waitressing and I uh, was teaching dance part-time and other jobs that I had into going into a professional work environment. And there was absolutely no training for that and no infrastructure for me and no personal development. And so unfortunately I had to fall on my like face multiple times, just trying to navigate and figure it out. Now, I'm not saying that that's how your SDRs are, but I'm giving you probably a worst case scenario to say that they need, they need help. And they need mentorship and they need guidance and they need somebody that's invested in them. After my first few months as a receptionist, I wasn't really feeling that job. And so I looked in the newspaper back then. This is 2006. <laughs> like you still look for jobs in the newspaper back then, but I found a job for my first huge career that I had. And for me, I know the reason that I was successful was because the sales manager was a mentor and he personally invested in developing me. And it wasn't just here's 10 ways to do your job. It was personally and professionally. And I had so much to learn. And I feel like that is a human component that's missing with a lot of SDR teams in addition to the actual systems and processes. So at Sales BQ, we get to work with a lot of sales departments. If we get brought in sometimes where there's an existing SDR team, their scripting and messaging is terrible if they even have it or they're just flying off the cuff. Then they sometimes have really outdated systems, meaning they're doing things manually that could be automated, which is an SDR killer from a productivity standpoint, or they're misusing automation tools. So just because you have a tool that can automate all of your communication doesn't mean that you should be. And there are components and steps in the cadence that need a more personal touch. And so there's a lot that has to do with infrastructure, but there is also a lot with people development. And so I want to hear your thoughts on this. AJ, I'll come to you first. We, we covered both the people side of it and, and structure, and then really the data side and the system side with the infrastructure on that component. What are you, what are you seeing? How does this resonate with you? 
it resonates greatly with me. I, I was in a very similar position when I first started in my career in sales development. First job right out of college. It, it was kind of that very typical, here's a computer, a list, um, very basic training, go get them. And kind of getting thrown into the fire like that, I, I look at it for myself, I mean, both as a positive and a negative. Negative in the sense that I didn't get what you're talking about. Um, I didn't get a lot of uh, understanding of A, how to act in the job, but B, just how to act as a professional. I'm you know, straight out of college, working with a bunch of other people who are straight out of college, and we don't really have that, like the leadership mentality to develop us as people and as employees. Um, but at the same time, it was almost a blessing for me because I got to find what worked and what didn't work for myself. Getting thrown into the fire like that is a way for you, if you, you alluded to it earlier, um, if you survive and you come out of it stronger on the other side. And it works for some people, it doesn't work for, for most people. I, I consider myself one of the lucky ones where I, I was able to get thrown into the fire and come out on the other side okay. Um, but it was something that looking back at sort of where my company is now and where we're building with SD Revolution, I wish I had that because who knows where I would be in my career now. Um, not saying that you know, obviously hindsight's 2020, not saying I would trade it for anything, but um, seeing what organizations have been able to build on the culture side of things and on the employee development side of things makes me a little bit jealous. I, I won't lie. Oh, man. I hear you on that too. I think back to my first sales role, and this is back when companies were really wanting to hire the sales unicorn that does it all. They build their own prospect database. They prospect them, set the meetings, do the discovery, do all of that. And man, I look back, I, I just think I was the number one rep, AJ, right? I sold a two, 2X, 3X, 4X of my quota. And had I had an actual engine, you know, I did all that manually. Every email I ever sent was manual. Every update in Salesforce, that. every logging. <laughs> All of it was manual. How much more powerful would I have been? And then not even to get into what we're doing now from a sales enablement standpoint, where we're pre-filling prospect databases with qualified leads based on an ICP. Holy crap. Do you know what I had to go through to build a prospect database? It was ugly. I mean, Grayson, yeah. what have you seen as far even just the evolution uh, from your own experience on these topics? Yeah, I think you really hit the nail on the head. And, you know, I, I know this, uh, your episode was focused on kind of hiring and training, but efficiency and kind of how SDRs go about their job, I think is super important. Um, I've, I've been engagement, uh, in en engagements before consulting people where their, their SDRs are using disparate spreadsheets, like, like on their own for their personal computer to, to track this or that, that may be opportunities that may be predictive intelligence, but I mean, there are so many tools out there that I think can help uh, organizations and, and help them in ways that they didn't even think possible. There, there are tools nowadays, for instance, that can actually go through and just collect all the data that you need for a specific segment. Um, you know, you might need to go through and review that data, but it no, it, it no longer requires a human being to go through and manually kind of review and then log that into a spreadsheet. Um, there's several, you know, solutions out there that can also clean data and, and provide predictive intelligence to score them or give them uh, the ability to prioritize those leads. And I, I remember even uh, three years ago, I mean, that, that was not very prevalent. And, you know, even with the uh, advent of uh, automation at that point, you were still having to do a lot of the personalization and the research piece on your own end to end as an SDR. And now I feel like we're at this unique opportunity to where SDRs can truly focus on the selling part and that frontline relationship while being supported by marketing or another organization with all the content and all the scripts and all the software that they need to just stay focused and stay just diligent on that buyer journey and that buyer story. This is so key. I feel like we as a community as of sales leaders and, and those that build out sales departments have made tremendous effort into building this infrastructure, bringing in sales enablement technology, bringing in automation. And I've seen a lot of companies, especially in the world of tech SaaS, this is where I see a majority of it, where they're really building these revenue engines. And Grayson, you made the comment about marketing. Is marketing doing their part? Are they fueling these MQLs and really teeing up the sales team to, to have conversations with pre-qualified 
buyers, which is incredible. You can have all this infrastructure, you can have all this automation, you can have great scripting and messaging, but what if you have the wrong SDR? How do corporations really identify the ideal hire? This is tough, right? If you're a corporation that's hiring on the younger end of the scale and coming out of college and just new into a working environment, how do you really know that this person can succeed? And what are you willing to do to mentor, train, develop, and ramp them up? And I think that this is defining that ideal hire. AJ, what are the top three characteristics that you believe a great SDR has, whether they've already proven themselves in the world of SDR or not? Uh, so the number one thing that I think every SDR needs to have is coachability. Um, you can have the brightest individual who says all of the right things, but if they think it's the right way to go about it and your organization doesn't necessarily match with them on that, um, if you can't coach to get them to where you want them to be, then it's not going to be a fit. Uh, and I think that that is something that a lot of organizations who do invest in training and coaching really look for in a rep is understanding whether or not all of their efforts make a difference or if they're just speaking into one ear and having to come out the other with somebody. Um, so coachability by far, I think, is the number one thing that um, a rep should have, in my opinion. Uh, secondarily to that, and they kind of go hand in hand, but uh, resiliency and sort of like a tough skin. Um, the fact of the matter is that the job of an SDR is, is tough. Sometimes you're going to get rejected a lot. And knowing that, uh, going into it with the right mindset makes a huge difference. If you can just kind of take those rejections and have them glance off of you uh, versus have them really impact your day-to-day -day operations, uh, it's going to make a huge difference. And, and then actually something that I sort of recently discovered and after going through the SD Revolution series and speaking with all of the guests that we had, um, I don't know how to actually quantify it or qualify it, I guess, but um, for a rep to be able to take a look at something like rejections and understand the benefit that they can provide an organization, I don't know if there's a word for that, uh, resourcefulness maybe, but that's something that I think all reps should have as well because in, in truth, if you do get rejected 96, 97% of the time, taking a look at those 97% of the activities that you do and trying to tease something out of that that can move the organization forward or provide some kind of qualification that maybe they weren't thinking of in the past, that I think is incredibly valuable for reps to have. So um, maybe in that order uh, that I described things, those are probably the top three that I would look for in an SDR and, and when building out a program and sort of looking for, like you said, that ideal rep, um, those would be at the top of my list for sure. Yeah, it has to be. And when you're interviewing for that ideal hire, being able to ask very specific questions, not yes or no questions. Would, would you mm -hmm. describe yourself as coachable? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's not the way we want to ask an interview question, but talking about a time in their life when they weren't good at something mm -hmm. and how did they get better at it? And what, when are they, how much do they try to do on their own versus seeking outside help or additional resources? And then what does it feel like to them? Like describe a time when you tried doing it all on your own and to find out you couldn't get it done. And how did it feel when you had to go to get outside help in order to finish that task? And you can ask questions like these and you want to hear things like, you know, it, it was, uh, it was a relief, honestly, to get that outside help. Or you might hear someone has a lot of pride, like, hey, it sucked. I really wanted to do that on my own. Like, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but are they really willing to go seek additional resources? There are ways that you can ask those questions. Grayson, what would you add to this list? I have one I'm dying to share, but I want to hear yours first. So what do you add to the ideal hire? Yeah, so um, the, the three things that have always stuck out in my mind, and I, I call it the three A's, is uh, adaptability, awareness, and ambition. So, you know, especially in today's world, what I've really recognized of kind of being a, a younger professional and seeing it from an outside box as, a, as an entrepreneur, you know, I wasn't primarily always a seller, so I had to learn it on my own. And I noticed, like, you know, everybody is pretty good at selling for specific industries, specific buyers, specific solutions, specific cycles. And, and as I took a step back, I was like, wow, to really master selling, especially end to end, you have to be able to adapt what you think you know and understand that 
you probably don't for this context or that context. And so being adaptable is, I think, huge, especially in today's market for jobs where usually you're horizontal. You're going to go from role to role, go from company to company as you kind of progress through your career. Um, two is awareness, because I think awareness goes to the heart of everything an SDR does, whether it be preparedness and doing research, whether it be like, like thinking about and prioritizing their leads, whether it be the, the questions that they ask on discovery calls. Awareness is huge. Um, I think the reason why I had an ambition, I was going to go with uh, dedication. Uh, but I, I love the word ambition because it's not just about being dedicated because you can be dedicated to something and do a terrible job. You can do something over and over and over again, but still fail to get the result that you need. But if you can mix in that, that passion to where not only am I dedicated, but I also have goals or, or a vision that I am going to commit to grabbing, then, I mean, even if you don't have adaptability and awareness, you're going to be able to get somewhere because that's a drive that I don't think many uh, or a majority of employees don't have um, on a, on a you know, regular basis. Yeah, that's key. And that's going to segue us into the next topic, but I'm going to pause for a second because I have to add mine in. One thing that I found way later in my career was my purpose. And I feel like when you're looking for an ideal hire, a great question is, what do you think your purpose is in life? Like why you were created and what your superhuman talents are, your desires, your passions. Like if you could do one thing in this world, what would it be? And then really backing into identifying attributes of that. Because I look at sales, I have a really big heart. So for me, I just want to solve people's problems. And what really fueled me and why I've done well in sales is that when I go to bed at night and I lay my head on the pillow, I feel like I had a good day if I made other people's lives better because I was in them. And that is the purpose for me. That is my underlying. So sales is a great profession for me because if I align myself with a great product and service, it's the easiest thing for me ever to diagnose if somebody needs it and solve their problem and sell it to them. It's not a matter of money or investments. Like I can help you. I can do this for you and you're going to be in such a better place. And then I feel like I reap the reward out of my client winning because I did something great for them. It sounds a little selfish when I say that out loud, but that is my underlying purpose. And I know that great salespeople have this, I'm going to use the word addiction and that's not the word I'm looking for, but it's just, they can't get enough of it. When you're living out your purpose, you have endless energy to do it. And I see a lot of salespeople that try out sales to see what it's like, or their friend does it or someone in the family, or they heard salespeople make a lot of money, or maybe they get afforded some cool opportunities like a flexible work schedule or whatever. The reasons that they're attracted to it, they may not know how their inner purpose aligns with the execution of the role, but I think it is very good to start with those interviewing questions to find out more about what truly, truly drives that person to succeed and to do work. And we'll talk about that in a second. And Grayson, that really hits that drive component. If you're excited and you're passionate and you wake up in the morning and you're so ready to do it, you never have to worry about somebody actually getting the job done. And so there's a direct correlation. So let's dig into that. It's called the behavioral quotient. That's the BQ in sales BQ. It's of behavioral intelligence. And the thought behind it is there are four components to the behavioral quotient. At the top, if you imagine a wheel right now, at the top is how you think. And your mental mindset fuels your emotions and it triggers your emotional state. So the data comes into your mind and how you process that data, you might be telling yourself some stories when that data enters your mind. And then when the data enters your mind, it's either a positive, negative, or neutral story. And then there can be varying degrees of that. And those trigger emotions. Your emotional state is then going to dictate your actions and the effort that you put out, which will, of course, result in your performance. And that's a BQ wheel. How you think fuels your emotions, fuels how you act, and then, of course, dictates your performance, your results. And so when we look at what you were saying, Grayson, about just that inner drive, the BQ wheel, I, I just did a, a podcast interview not long ago with Andy Paul, and this is one of the big call outs that people have that they're resharing on social media is talking about the BQ component about how I made the comment, 
you need to be smart in sales. You need to know your product and service inside and out. You need to know your industry. You need to know the competitive marketplace. You need to understand the day in the life of your buyer. You need to speak intelligently. You need all of those things so that they trust you. That builds credibility when you actually know what you're selling and how it makes their life better. Second, EQ, being a good human being, good emotional intelligence, able to pivot, have emotional self-awareness. Um, you also mentioned awareness. Being able to be responsive to others as they shift and pivot physically, emotionally, being able to see them and hear them in the sales call and really just align with the problems that they're trying to solve and remove your agenda from it. But you can have those things. You can be wicked smart. You can be a great human being and super emotionally connected and aware. But the BQ is where you actually do the work. That's where you show up and actually execute. That's where you show up every single day and do all the thousand actions that need to happen in order to be great in your career. And when you're an SDR, we manage a lot of SDRs. We coach a lot of SDRs. I know what their daily cadence and their calendars look like, and it is a lot of activities that need to happen. What's the drive? What's fueling that? What's their passion? What's their purpose? What about the job is getting them excited to get up in the bed in the morning? I mean, this is a, a significant component that I feel like not everyone understands that it will drive and fuel salespeople because this goes back to what AJ was talking about with rejection. Are they resilient? I don't know another career where you get knocked down this many times. And you can still find joy and passion in the one out of 100 wins or the one out of 50 wins, whatever your conversion rate is, one out of 1,000 wins. If that feels better than the 99 out of 100 rejections, you're in the right profession. But if the 99 out of 100 brings you so far down that the one out of 100 doesn't get you to where you want to be, then that's a problem. So, Grayson, I'll come to you at this point. Where have you seen BQ help and, and hinder SDRs in their role? Yeah, I think uh, this is a really good topic, especially because SDRs are, are generally young, um, but ego uh, and pride. I think one, one hidden trap of, of that BQ wheel is, you know, you can, you can think effectively or efficiently, you know, you can have positive or uh, opportunistic emotions, but if, if you are all about your ego, all about your, your self-image among others and, and how people perceive you, your actions won't always translate. Even if you're thinking correctly, even if you're feeling correctly, you've got to be able to do exactly what you said, Mary, which is like really pull yourself out of the situation and say like, I'm just a facet and I'm here to connect a person with a solution and learn more, you know, like I'm not the best seller. I'm not totally going to close them on this call, you know, like getting in that mindset, like ambition is good, but if it goes so past the point of overconfidence to where you, you, you could let the ego get in the way. Sometimes that can be uh, what I've seen, of, both for myself and for others that I've worked with, that can be a, a big crux uh, that turns into a larger problem as it grows because it's a hidden problem, but it's a very present problem in every activity that you do. Yeah, and, and look, the IQ and the EQ are, are required. So what you just said is, is really important. You can have all this drive and the BQ and all this ambition and running a million miles a minute, but if your IQ and EQ aren't there, that's like a bull in a china shop. I mean, that's somebody that could come across as arrogant or mm -hmm. have an ego or overconfident or aggressive or pushy, or there are all these terms that we've heard be aligned with sales. And so th what a great call out. You have to have the other components. If you want to be that top performer, you've got to know your product and service inside and out. Be a credible resource. This is one of the areas with an SDR that I find to be very interesting for people that choose to hire uh, brand new green versus experienced SDRs that have a lot of years in the sales function, truly understanding how to have powerful conversations with their buyers, with their prospects. And there's a huge difference here. So when we look at training on product and service, it's one thing to train somebody to be able to recite it's quite another to get them to talk from a place of known frame of reference and known quantity. And when we can recite, that's great. You memorize the manual or you memorize the sales engineer, solution engineer's demo word for word. I'm really proud of you. It's good because that's the first step in learning it. But if you don't have context or frame of reference, the moment that the prospect asks you a question that throws you off your script, you're hosed. And it's super obvious that you don't actually know what you're talking about, you're simply reciting. And so there, there's a big gap on that. 
AJ, what do you think is the right way to help people, uh, help SDRs that are green and new into sales as a whole, or even in the business world that don't have, I think of it as like file drawers in my brain. I think about every experience I've ever had in my life has its own file drawer and there's all these files in it. And so now at this stage of my career, 12 years into my professional career, oh my gosh, it's more than that. 14 years into my professional career, I can't handle myself. I look back and I can answer with, with confidence and knowledge to just about anything that anyone asks me anymore. I'm very rarely unable to confidently answer a question that was 14 years of building these file drawers. And that's why prospects love buying for me, but I did do it early in my career. I made it a, a point to learn, 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 so that I could have that as quickly as possible as a 24 year old out selling to executives, selling $50,000, $100,000 price tag services. And so what do you think SDRs can do to really build the file drawers and have frame of reference when they're speaking? Yeah. Um, one of the big things that I think, uh, and this is more on the organization than on the SDR themselves, but it's um, introducing them to the idea of sort of how the marketing team can help move them along sort of down the path that you're talking about. What you described is actually something that I heard on an interview recently where um, instead of just reciting something, uh, you need to be able to pivot like you were talking about. That's basically the, the role of marketing and content marketing at an organization. If someone wants to just learn more about your product or solution, buyers are so far down the funnel at this point that they would rather just read a brochure or go on your website and read a white paper than get the same exact information from an SDR. And I think that, first of all, it's, it's letting them know that's the case here. Like, this is different than what it used to be and organizations need to adapt and make that shift and understand that sales development can't just be that recital moment where they have to take the information and spit it back out at somebody. Um, and introducing an SDR to the marketing team and sort of getting them to work together, I think illuminates that a little bit more for reps. Um, them seeing what marketing is putting out and recognizing that someone can get that by reading the white paper versus me telling it to them is sort of a light bulb moment for, for the right SDRs out there who, who recognize this is something that I can't just do to differentiate myself. I have to find a way to, like you said, sort of build up this, this file cabinet of experience. And um, the best way in my mind to do that is to invest in training, coaching, do scenario training, and really make sure that, that reps are quick on their feet and you're, you're peppering them with questions that they should be hearing on the phone uh, and, and not grading them, but in some capacity tracking their progress and understanding how effectively did you rebut my question that maybe was a bit out of left field um, were you thrown off your game? Were you able to continue the conversation as normal? Um, and it's a lot of investing in that side of the, the team building that helps prepare reps for that because it's something they can't really do on their own. Um, like you said, it, it is built up over years and years of experience. And if they have no years of experience and they just kind of get out there and see what happens, um, it's tough to, to be able to handle that. So it's, I think it's a combination of teams focusing on that and making sure that they're giving their reps the right training, coaching, resources for that, and them going out there in the real world, doing it and sort of seeing how they match. Yes, and I think that building an FAQ is super helpful for the training component is that somebody internally, and maybe it's just a roundtable effort from existing salespeople, is to list every common question that your buyer asks and build an FAQ. You can go back and listen to recorded calls. You can ask the salespeople point blank, what are the top 10 questions you are asked on every call? What are the trends? And build that as an FAQ because if the salespeople are being asked those questions, the SDRs are most likely also gonna be asked those questions from an early stage buyer. If it's an outbound or if it's an inbound and they've already done 80%, they're gonna be well positioned to build a rapid fire their questions that they have and there may they, that first impression is going to be critical. And so I think that that is important to build the FAQ. I also feel like because those are real, real world, real context questions, it does start to fill in the gaps for them to understand the product and service that's being sold versus the pains and problems that it solves and how it aligns with the buyer's day in the life. I think it's critical to have that component in there. So then on the other side of that is we have, we have the FAQ 
but also having them sit in shadow and listen on to full recorded sales meetings. And I think that is part of training, even if I'm, I'm, I'm saying they may only work in the SDR function and they're just building inbound or doing some outbound qualifying and teeing up, but have them listen to hours worth of recorded sales conversations. So again, they can fill in the holes. They should have the wherewithal to understand because it's the first impression of the company. And if that buyer is super qualified and they're 80% down the line and they come to that rookie SDR and they're asking what would be seemingly common questions that somebody should be able to answer and it falls flat, it's a negative impression of the company. And the last thing that I think is a great resource here is objection handling or managing objections, however you uh, prefer to call that, is again, having all the salespeople round table, what are the most common objections that we get? And then being able to have a list of here's what we say to every common objection. And prospecting objections are different typically than sales objections. When you're in the sales conversation, those are a little bit more in depth. They could be a little bit more technical, like, hey, I really like your user interface, um, it's super nice, but I feel like it's prettier than it is functional. And I'm really concerned about our growing company and how that's gonna compete. How do you compare to fill in the blank? I feel like theirs is far more robust and I'm, I'm just really leaning towards having a less pretty uh, system and having more capabilities on the back end as we scale. So I'm just not sure you're the right fit. So that's a really powerful objection. Someone in sales is gonna to need to know that, but here's where that translates. If I'm an SDR and I hear that and I hear a named competitor and I learn how we're different, if I'm prospecting and I hear that they're using that named competitor, now as an SDR, I'm equipped. If, if that prospect is saying, you know, we're all set, we use ABC company. Oh, I'm actually pretty familiar with them. We had recently a company uh, not too different from yours that was in a demo with one of our sales engineers and did a really great explanation of side by side and how they felt our technology compared and they had some really interesting feedback. Do you have a few minutes? Well, I've got you on the phone now. I can share with you what they said and maybe this will merit a further conversation. So there's something about frame of reference that could listening into that, that could pull them in and connect the dots with the SDRs. I just feel like we're missing such a huge training component in most of the SDR organizations. So the last question I wanna expand on is just your opinion on hiring seasoned SDRs versus hiring, which seems to be a very common traditional model, which we've talked about multiple times, which is the green, the out of school, the entry level. And, and Grayson, what are, what's your viewpoint on this and where do you think it's gonna go? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, I, I have personally been in the camp that sales development is going to evolve into its own kind of standalone department with specialized professionals that get paid well for what they do. Um, when will that come? I don't know. Um, so that question is a little bit contextual and depends on you know, what your organization's doing, what their goals are. What I would say is for younger reps, uh, it's really great, I know because I'm young, uh, to get younger people into newer processes or maybe if you're making a change or trying to, to spice things up in your SDR program, I personally think that younger SDRs are the best because it's clean slate. If they're coachable, like AJ mentioned, then they'll be super absorbent of everything you say. But in the meantime, they're out of the box and they're just entering the sales space and probably have a lot of feedback to share. Whereas, you know, seasoned SDRs probably already kind of have their box, already have what they think is best. And they are usually better for kind of bringing power to an already kicking engine, uh, if you will. Yeah, it's an incredible viewpoint. I think there's pros and cons with, with both. I think you can hire a season, but I do believe that SDRs, that this can be not just a placeholder, a career progression, a six months and move on, that there are going to be some SDRs that are so fantastic and successful in what they're doing. This could be more of an established position. And as more automation comes through as sales enablement tools and as this as the revolution continues forth and we see more of it maturing, I really think that there's a, quite a bit of power behind the role. And AJ, why don't you uh, put a bow on this interview today and share your thoughts on hiring fresh or hiring experience and, and really anything else you wanna share? Yeah, I would have to uh, mostly agree with what Grayson said, sort of the, the malleability and coachability of a, of a new SDR coming in straight out of college is something that um, I do believe is sort of the, 
the ideal scenario for you to have. Um, but there is also the benefit of bringing in someone who might be a bit more seasoned in sort of um, like a pseudo management uh, player coach kind of role. Uh, I've seen it work very successfully at a lot of different companies, someone who might have a few years of experience and they're able to bring that general knowledge of not just being a, a good employee or a good SDR, but someone who can who can coach and mentor reps that they feel like are on a similar level to them versus someone who might be a manager or director level, like directly above them. Uh, it, it tends to ease uh, them into the role a little bit more and, and provide some comfort where if there was no sort of middle layer there, they kind of feel like they've just been thrust into this role. They have to learn everything as fast as possible. It's, it's like drinking out of a fire hose. You know, it's just all of this information going in you at once and you're wary that you're not gonna be able to retain it all. But having a seasoned rep there, who's able to sort of cue you in on what's really important, what might not be as important, could help that newer rep make that transition a bit easier um, and understand whether or not like, A, this is the right role for them, be how they want to sort of progress through the company and what their future might look like. Um, so I do think that ideal scenario, uh, young, new rep, but there's a ton of benefits when it comes to having a seasoned rep on the team to sort of player coach those new reps through. And it kind of depends on, you know, how you want to build your company and whatnot. Yes, agreed. And I'm a big fan of people saying they're in their lane. And if you're an SDR and you flourish and you love it and your passion has been identified, like your purpose, you get up, you're excited and you're doing great work, like stay in the role. Don't feel pressured that you need to progress or you need to go into management because holy smokes, that's a whole different bag of tricks that you need to be in management or need to progress. Maybe your skill set really isn't in follow through and great uh, uh, demoing and proposing and closing in the back half of that. Maybe you're not meant to be in full cycle sales. It, there's nothing wrong with you being a phenomenal SDR and having that be your career and passion of, of choice. And I've known some pretty seasoned SDRs that are so fulfilled by the work. And it's brilliant to see them continue to perform and AJ, you're exactly right. They are then the in-house mentor <laughs> and everyone else coming on board, maybe without the direct management function that's required of that, but people will look up to them and their team members will say, I want to be like this person. And so when you can see more of that senior level SDR, that's really walking the walk, talking the talk, it's very powerful within an organization. All right, we're going to wrap this up. Let's hear it one more time, how we can connect and where we're going to follow you. And then I'm going to put a bow on this. Yeah, of course. So if you guys want to check out Sales Development Revolution and check out some of our free courses and blog content, you can go to sdrevolution.com um, or check us out at SD Revolution on LinkedIn. Uh, we, we post regularly there. So uh, keep in touch. Beautiful. Well, thank you both for being on today's episode of the Quota Crusher podcast. This was definitely a longer interview than we normally do, but I just couldn't end it sooner than we did. So jam-packed, so powerful. I have a feeling this one's going to be shared heavily and played back on repeat. Thank you both for joining us today. Don't forget to connect with me, Mary Grothy, on LinkedIn and learn more about SalesBQ at salesbq.com. <laughs>